Welcome to Team Perry's Step Out of Line podcast, featuring co-hosts Perry and Lori Finkelstein. Together, they explore, meet, and share inspirational stories with guests who have made a positive impact in today's world. This podcast resonates with our hope to make this world a better place one step at a time through love, acceptance, and uplifting conversations. I love the idea of of stepping out of line because I think, you know, it depends on each of us, but even stepping out of line in small ways, you know, when you, before you started telling me all the incredible things about the, you know, some of the ways Perry steps out of line, you know, I was even thinking about right now, I'm really working on setting boundaries and just speaking up for myself and just communicating little things to people. And it's so hard for me. And I think, um, you know, it was, I was taught when I was younger sort of to not speak up and I didn't want to rock the boat and I didn't want to be seen as difficult. And I just wanted to be, I want everything to be easy. And I think, you know, growing up now and learning uh, just different things in life and learning, you know, different lessons, I've just learned the importance of speaking up and it, it, it is so hard and I still struggle with it no matter how big or how small it is. But I would say I stepped out of line or stepped out of line when I, I guess, spoke up during the Me Too movement a couple of years ago because, you know, coming from a sport in gymnastics where everything is supposed to be, you know, by the book. And um, I really didn't feel like I had a voice and I kind of did everything I was told to do. And I always wanted to be seen as a good girl and I didn't want to be difficult. And so speaking up was... I guess, in the gymnastics community scene as being out of line, but I'm very grateful that I received so much support from so many people, you know, in the gymnastics community, but also outside of it. Uh, And I also think that there's uh, a lot of pressure, I think, that men and women face that we, that society puts on us, you know, and I think stepping out of line is being you know, truly authentically yourself and being who you want to be, no matter what society tells you you should or shouldn't do. And that's not always easy to do that because people around you might be judgmental or it depends on your circumstances. Right. I know my mom, she passed away when she was, I think, 64. And when she turned 60, she says, that's it. I'm not holding back anymore. I'm just going to say what I want to say. And I looked at her, I said, I thought you were doing that your entire life. Like she was <laughs> a little, little wild in that sense. And when she passed away and I was 30 something, I said, I am not going to wait until I'm 60 to be myself. I'm just going to start now. You are you have one sibling or you have- I actually am the oldest of four. So I- Do you think that you never wanted to rock the boat also because you were the older one, you probably had more responsibility. You know, you have to behave a certain way when you're older. A younger child, I think it's, I was younger. I'm a younger child that got away with murder doing my mother's say, getting away with murder. You're not doing, you know, what you're supposed to do. And it'd be like, well, I don't care because my sister, that was her job. Do you think that was kind of your job as the older sibling? Be- you know, I, I've always just loved being an older sister. And I think from the time I was a teenager, I was became more aware that a lot of things revolved around my gymnastics training. So I think I still feel this pressure to, not this pressure, but this want to make sure that whatever we're doing, it's not about me because for so long it was, you know, when I was around 10 years old and, you know, or I guess until the age before I could drive, my parents would have my sisters come in the car to drive me to and from practice because they couldn't be left home alone. And that was a big sacrifice, you know, for my family. And at 10 years old, I didn't understand how lucky I was that my parents could drive me and that my sisters would come in the car with me. But I realize that now, and as I've gotten older, I've realized that. So I think it's more a lot of things were revolved around me. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it, it's certain things of, you know, even if my sisters go to college, if people, you know, that, that know who I am there, know that they're my sisters, sometimes they, um, they, they get nervous that they're not actually friends with them and they want to get to me. It's just sort of, um, I'm always careful of that and just want to make sure that they, know that they 
are very special and unique in their own way and that they don't um, compare themselves to me. So I, I'm aware of that. I think my pressure of not wanting to speak up was also just simply, I think, not really understanding that what was happening to me, uh, that there was a better way or that it was wrong. I think it was the lack of education and conversation. I think it needs to be a conversation in schools where, you know, kids, boys and girls are taught the importance of, you know, trusting your gut and listening to your inner guide and asking questions if you're confused and talking about things, you know, even if you're unsure, you know, asking questions can keep you or your friends safe. And so I just don't think there's enough conversation around that. And I think it's something that really needs to, to be in school, just like you're, you know, required to take a math class and you're required to take a gym class. You should be required to learn how to like self soothe and take care of yourself and um, a place where you can go to ask questions. Perry and I were talking also um, right before we came on. She's going to be 21 in two weeks. And, you know, 20 is a big deal. 18 is a big deal. What am I going to do at 21? You know, what's going to be different at 21? When you turned 21, did you feel when you woke up that day and you were 21 that here I am, I'm like really an adult, not just 18 mm -hmm. adult, like I'm really an adult now. Is My life is going to change. Did you feel different mm -hmm. at 21? You know, I was still training. So it was about a year and a few months before the Olympics. So I think I was probably more freaked out that the Olympics were about a year away because that goes by so fast once you get that close. I think like next year I'm going to be 27. And I think that is where I'm like, I can't believe I'm 20. I'm oh, going to be 27. Right. But I definitely think there's certain ages. I always feel like birthdays are... I don't know why I always get a little bit more anxious on my birthdays. I think that there's, do you feel the same way? Yeah. She, she never enjoys a birthday. I yeah, I feel so anxious. I don't know. I think, and sometimes I feel that way sometimes about like New Year's or like, you know, certain holidays. Oh, we're the same. <laughs> we're just meant to be connected because I think there's so much pressure to have fun. And especially with social media, it's like, you feel like you're missing out or you feel like you should be doing this extravagant thing. And I feel like my, for birthdays, it's like this pressure to have this be this special day. And it's just a normal day that sometimes I just feel, I try to make it like a normal day, but I don't know. Yeah. It's, it's, that's interesting that you feel the same way. So she's born on December 31st. So you can't pick a worse day for somebody who <laughs> really wants to play, you know, key, low key birthday. It's just a lot of stress and pressure. Um, about the Olympics, you were the captain of the, the team. How did that happen? Did they, did you just naturally gravitate toward that position? Was it because you have to be really a team player at that point and want the best for everybody, not just yourself? So was that an easy, thing to come to you to to be a, an easy transition for you to be captain yeah so I was the oldest of both of my Olympic teams and the first Olympics in 2012 I remember we were in London and I just remember the girls had voted for me and it was super casual I don't think I understood what it meant to be the captain of the team and then in 2016 I found out I was the captain on Twitter I don't even think anyone voted it was so funny. I think my mom texted me and uh, sent me the link to uh, a Twitter post about it. So that's how I found out about it. But, you know, as I've gotten older, I've, I've had more time to have it sink in. And uh, I say, I guess, sink in kind of lightly because it still doesn't really feel real that I actually went to the Olympics. It's very surreal. But I think, you know, growing up and being the oldest of four kids and, and, uh, you know, my coaches always told me that it was really important to be a team player because it is so important when you're competing, like what people remember, of course, you know, people love watching the all around final and the event finals. And those are amazing. But I also think that to be able to compete in the team final and to, you know, so many people come together and watch us and we're so, so lucky for that, that I think it just makes it really special when you're able to you know, obviously life isn't about winning, but when you're able to do it together with your teammates, we work so hard. It uh, just makes it really special. And um, yeah, you know, I also think the thing about gymnastics is that it's a, uh, it's a individual sport, you know, most of the time, but then you also have a team sport. And so you have both of those. So you have to be 
you know, competing for yourself, but then also competing with your teammates the next day. And so it's really important that you are a team player from start to finish. And when you're not even in the gym, because there were some nights where, or some competitions where I'm rooming with one of my teammates and one of us might be going to sleep as the Olympic champion and the other one might be not, you know, and, and so sometimes if you are both fighting for that, um, that same medal, it, it, it's really hard. And so I think it's just important to remember that there's more to life than being number one on the podium, even though at the time it feels like so consuming and just, it's all that you want. But I think the most important thing, honestly, is, is the journey and having fun. When I look back at my memories that stick out aren't standing on the podium. It's really in the dorm rooms with my teammates and just laughing and being silly and having fun. Those are honestly the moments that I remember the most. And so that's the team part of it. So you retire in January this past year and you're ready to have like this most amazing life of leading a normal life of, a, you know, a beautiful 26 year old girl, <laughs> your apartment, and then COVID hits and it's, it's not, life is not the way that you think it's going to be. How is that adjustment? Did you, you talk a lot about, um, you know, meditating and, uh, gardening and relaxing and taking time for yourself throughout the day of being, you know, being self-aware of how you feel. Is that the key that has gotten you through this pandemic and also getting a new dog, a puppy who <laughs> loves yeah. and, and loves you unconditionally? Is, is that what's gotten you through this transition until life can begin again? You know, I feel like during this time, I've really, taken some time to do a lot of reflection. I'm really big onto doing a lot of work on myself. I do a lot of therapy. Uh, I do meditation and gardening and stuff like that. Uh, I've just really been spending some time and, and working on myself. And, uh, you know, before COVID, I was so lucky to be so busy. And sometimes I was on a plane, you know, five times a week. You know, I was so grateful to be so busy. And I think it was a really important moment for me to just realize, just to kind of take a second, hit pause. And, and I think some other people felt the same way that we're traveling or going really fast and just really prioritizing what's important in life and taking some time to recognize, you know, my privilege and how lucky I am that I am, you know, safe and that I'm healthy. And just really, I've been really thinking about, ways that I can do better and do more and use my platform to give back. So I've been really reflecting on that and, and taking some time. And I read this amazing quote that said something about, you know, I wanted to change the world. So I started with myself and I really like that. And I think that's really beautiful, um, you know, because there's so many there's so many things going on in the world that need help. And, you know, if we're not taking care of ourselves first, no matter how much we want to help, if we're not filling up our tank first, we can't help other people. That's right. I'm looking at Perry's wall right now. She has all of her marathon medals hanging up and there's a quote on top of the rack and it says, she believed she could, so she did. And I think you can't believe that you can do anything unless you really look into yourself and your own person to see what you can do. So I think that goes hand in hand. You and Perry, two different worlds. You've never met until last week when she was fortunate enough to get picked by Ari and yourself to have a conversation with you. And yet right away, I know Perry felt a connection with you and I think you did as well. It's a little, a little strange, but some words that you describe yourself or some of your favorite words like fierce, mm -hmm. I think of Perry also as fierce. Mm -hmm. She doesn't, but I do. She's fierce and she's strong and um, she never gives up. And I don't think you have ever given up on anything. And, and I had read that right before, I think it was your final floor exercise and you were so nervous and you didn't think you could do it. And your coach said, you can do it. You train for it, just go and do it. And then you describe the experience as if you were floating. It's like, you don't even remember going through it. You were floating. And I know at times Perry also, nervous about something or can she do it and then as she does it it's like the best feeling in the world mm -hmm. and um, I just think it, it requires a lot of bravery and it requires 
Jay Glazer we interviewed and he's a uh, football an analysis and he's very big into working out and he has his own business of his gym and he finished the interview. He told Perry, he goes, you know, you're a gangster. And I said, yeah, she's really gangster because here she is, you know, this little tiny person and you wouldn't know by what she can contribute that she is this tiny little thing i think also you know people underestimate her because she does have a disability and just the way that you related to her in our conversation last week i don't think that even crossed your mind for a second that she was anything but spectacular or had super amount of potential you know, that that came across immediately to her and she was so so happy and so grateful but um it was just very sweet and it just shows your character that, you know, you just, you just get it. Which is your all time favorite quote that you could think of or? I really like the quote. It goes something like, if you believe in magic, you will find it. And I just love the idea. It kind of reminds me of gardening. And what I love about gardening in, in nature is that no two days in nature are the same. And, you know, you can wake up every day and look at a beautiful bright flower and think, oh, I saw that yesterday or I see that all the time or you can really choose to see the magic in it. And I think nature is really grounding and allows me to be present and just allows me to practice gratitude. And when I grow, you know, certain stuff from seed and I'm able to actually eat the food, I feel like I cherish it so much more. And I know that this certain, you know, zucchini took months and months to grow. So it just, it's a little bit more special than, you know, I, it allows me to not take things for granted. Uh, we have a pool in our backyard, and while we swim in the pool, and Perry loves swimming, my husband reaches over and picks from the garden because he did a really beautiful garden this year because we couldn't go food shopping, so it was perfect. And to me, also, to eat like a tomato that's still warm from the sun, and it's like you've never tasted anything like that in your entire life, and you yeah. really appreciate it because you grew it, and you know exactly what you put on it. You know, you didn't put pesticides on it. You didn't, you know, put anything that's going to harm you. So I, I get it. That's one of the nicer things that, you know, COVID has brought us is that we were able to do that and, and enjoy it and not, you know, and not take it for granted. So that was, that was kind of nice also that we did that. What um, else did you guys grow? Oh, I have an orchid. Oh, nah. She has a, a pretty, a beautiful orchid that a friend of mine gave us for her room. But nah, yeah. outside we had, what was the tomato that the tomato that we loved? Uh, was it a? Uh, is it the little one or the big ones? It was a little one, but it grows like uh, a dark red. Yeah. So good. You can eat the tomatoes almost like an apple. They're so right. good. Yeah. So the little ones were amazing. Um, zucchini, we had like a blight, like. Like we haven't been able to grow a good zucchini in a long time. Right. Oh, I think I n might know why. Uh, um, so it might be because they're not being pollinated enough by the bees. So what you can actually do is like you can kind of self pollinate it yourself. And no, no, my husband spent the entire summer self pollinating. I said, oh. "Hold us something yeah, else." He did the like he took yeah. the different flowers and self pollinated. Yeah. And every time you would talk about it, it would be like, "Okay, yeah, so yeah. so Perry's dad was a little <laughs> wild." When he heard we were interviewing you, he said, oh, tell her I used to be really great at cartwheels. But now he's, like, he's, an, he's a lawyer who's like an, an, a little overweight Jewish old lawyer man. And he said, if she could teach me to cartwheel again, tell her I'll come and paint her house. I was like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was talking talk about gardening, too. Right. So he loves to garden. He's a little crazy. We spent the entire summer self-pollinating and we just couldn't listen to him anymore. That's Oh, we him and I would get along great. That's all I want to talk about, too. I love it. And he's like cucumbers. We had amazing cucumbers because he grew up like a vine that he planted. And um, that was nice. I mean, I love tomatoes the best and peppers. My favorite thing oh, is basil. I love my favorite thing is because um, we've been doing more cooking like everybody else in the world is to go outside and like, you know, as I'm cooking in the morning and just pick what I need. And like, and like Thanksgiving, I had um, thyme and rosemary growing mm -hmm. in the front. And so I just went out my, in my pajamas, grabbed some and stuffed it in my turkey. And, you know, it was so much better because you grew it. Yeah. So to me to be able to pick stuff and use it and not have anything go to waste, I loved it. So good. It smells good. Oh, we have a huge mm -hmm. yellow plant. Cool. I wish we lived close by because I would drive one over because oh, I have that's so cool. plants that keep having babies or pups. And my oh, husband really 
He keeps replanting pups and I have pups and pups and whoever. I didn't know that they planted the pups. I have a bit of mini banana tree in my broom and it has the pups too. They're little plant. They're little baby uh, for anyone watching who doesn't know the pups, how you describe them. They're like, so you have like one big banana tree and then the pups are like the baby ones that will eventually grow into the big one, but they're just, they're called, they're like pups, like puppy goes into a dog. <laughs> I love him. So he spends half his life worried about his pups and he has to replant his pup. So he, yeah. he planted, I don't know, like six pups and he's bringing them in the house to show me. And he, he dropped them all over. So cool. Do you guys use aloe on your face or anything or skin? Skin, um, yeah. because when you break it, it, it has the gel like you would buy in a bottle, but it's so yeah. much fresher and they're so huge. So um, I may, I had the misfortune error of buying him a plant once and it just keeps reproducing. I have, I have aloe plants all over my house. We don't know what to do with it. So anybody wow. who comes to the door who shows any amount of kindness to us, I'm from <laughs> Pop home with you. That's so awesome. I didn't know I have a little one, but it's just in a small pot, so it won't grow that big. I didn't know that they'll grow into huge ones. I'm going to try that this summer and plant it outside. Right. And then you have to bring it inside because you're on the East Coast. Yeah. So you have to bring it in inside for the Yeah. Place. But how does wow. a banana, tree, banana tree grow? In, in I have no idea, honestly. I have it by the window and I have a uh, lemon and lime tree and actually a grapefruit tree. And everything so far is doing really well. So I have no idea how it's still alive, but it's by my window and it's oh, cool. surprisingly doing well. It's my first time trying all this stuff indoor. And have you gotten any fruit from it yet? I have gotten a couple of lemons and I've gotten my... Grapefruit is almost ready. I honestly don't really like the taste of grapefruit, but I know a lot of people that do. And I was like, why wouldn't I want a mini grapefruit tree in my home? It's so cool. So I have it, but I don't really like grapefruit. Um, I was once in Lowe's and I was actually purchased somebody's entire cart of vegetables instead of my own. Oh my I, gosh. I came home here. I'm like this crazy woman coming home with my, not my cart. And we so planted funny. everything. And we grew like crazy things that summer. It was amazing. Then we realized- yeah you know, step out of line and grow something they're not used to, you know, growing. Yeah. And so and you learn every year, you know, you learn what works, what doesn't work. Uh, it's so interesting to learning about like the quality of our soil too, that impacts how stuff grows. And I read somewhere and, you know, who knows if this is accurate, but it was very interesting is that we would have to eat about eight oranges in order to get the same nutritional value that like my grandparents would, would have gotten with just eating one orange. Like because the quality of our soil is so, has declined so much. I even see it when I grow stuff now. It's just stuff doesn't grow the same way. I think that it used to, and it's really hard to find like really good quality soil. So it's also, I don't know about you guys, but it's so eye opening to see when you're planting at home and you see, you know, something like a carrot taking months and months and months to grow, or even like a tomato from seed. And then you go to the grocery store and it's just like an abundance of all this food. I'm like, how, what are they spraying on this to get this to grow so fast? And I've tried to grow Brussels sprouts the last couple of years. And I mean, there's so many at the grocery store all the time. And I'm like, what is the secret? Because I have not had any luck right. doing this. Like you either gets infested with bugs. It's hard to find that balance of like, I obviously don't spray my stuff with, you know, anything, but then sometimes it gets ruined and it gets infested with bugs. <laughs> I know like Listerine, you can spray on some stuff to get the bugs away, you know, stuff that you, you know, wouldn't harm it. Uh, we have a squirrel that has become my husband's like arch rival. And he, my, uh, my husband hides inside until he sees the squirrel and then throws green tomatoes at it to try to get it because it's, it's very, you know, it knows exactly where my husband is, mm -hmm. and kill the food and then run away with it. He's so angry. I have footage of him throwing tomatoes at the squirrels. Oh so my gosh. The, yeah, we have some, uh, some rabbits in the, uh, where we live, we're at my parents' house. And I actually, sometimes my mom gets annoyed. I'm like, no, I'm like, it's, they're so cute. Just let them eat it. I just love watching them like nibble on the stuff. It's so cute. When you were um, doing gymnastics in uh, like a competition, did you ever get to the point where right before, no matter, you know, you were prepared and you, you know, did so much work to put, you know, to get to that point. Did you ever like not like, like freeze or see anybody else freeze that they just couldn't function? 
Yeah, I think it happens a lot and it happens a lot at practice too because it, the things we're doing in gymnastics are so dangerous and so scary and very high level. So sometimes you just get there and you're like, I feel like I forgot how to do this or I'm afraid I'm going to hurt myself. You kind of psych yourself out. So that happened all the time and it was really frustrating and uh, it's such a mental sport. But yeah, sometimes before a competition, like right before I'm about to go, I'm thinking, I really hope I remember how to do this. I hope my body remembers how to do this because there's so much pressure and I think, you know, especially at the Olympics, it's just there's so much nerves in there and I'm so nervous that I'm going to mess up and that so many people are watching and it's just like you work so hard. You're like, I have a minute and a half to do this. And if I mess it up, I'm going to be so upset. You know, it's like it's the fear of if you make a mistake there, it's the fear of like, will I recover? Will I be OK? You know, and obviously you will be okay. But I think there's so much pressure that our society even puts on athletes, you know, even like with like a Super Bowl game or the Stanley Cup final, like there's just so much pressure. And if somebody messes up, people just tear them apart. You know, the media tears them apart if one person messes up and it's like, we're all human and we're all doing the best that we can. So it is really, it's very, uh, I honestly don't miss it because it's just nice to not have that much pressure <laughs> you know sometimes like before I would go I remember before I would compete on beam I would be like why do I put myself through this it's just so much pressure isn't it amazing the impact that stress and like nerves or anxiety has on us like you could come so prepared for something like a test then when you get there you're like I know I studied this and I know I know it I just you know, it's just incredible the impact that, like, uh, that has on our brains. Right. Were you going to go to Tokyo to be a commentator or be uh, an analyst for, you know? So we didn't have anything that. set in stone. I would definitely was really interested in that and having conversations with um, different uh, media outlets because I was hoping to do that. I would still love to do it. I am not sure where things stand. Like, I don't even know if I'd be able to go. Uh, I have no idea what's going to happen. I'd still love to to be able to do that and to do some sort of gymnastics expert, I guess, sort of thing during the competitions and helping people back home better understand certain stuff. But I, I don't know if, they, if I did that, if I would do it from here. I don't know if I'd be there, if it's safe to travel there. So it's just going to be, I mean, I feel like it's just, we're just going to have to wait and see. Yeah, none of us know. So are you, when you do that and you, when you talk about somebody the way that they're, you know, doing the routine, are you going to remember in your head, oh my God, I have to be nice because I would want somebody also oh. to. Yes. I would make sure to be very nice because, because everyone is doing the best that they can. And uh, it's, it's a lot of pressure. It's really hard. And then I would also say some of the girls that are competing now, wow. whether they're from the U S or, or another country watched us compete. And I would never want to say something bad. I would never want someone I looked up to in the previous Olympics to say something bad about me, but either way, even if they didn't know who I was, I would be very nice. And there are certain ways, you know, you can phrase things. If someone makes a mistake, I feel like I would want to be that person that's like, it's okay. They made a mistake and try to get everyone back home to remember that they're human and they, it's okay. Uh, but I do think at least in the athletics world, I think things are slowly shifting where you're starting to see more people in the media, even if they're not the number one person or the number one team. And so that's nice. We're starting to see more people are speaking up more and they're, you know, in the media for that versus like what place they're on the podium and still things need to get better and it still needs to be more about you know it doesn't matter if you're you know 50th place in the world you still should be doing interviews it shouldn't just be you know the the people on the podium that are getting invited to do interviews and stuff so I think things are slowly shifting but I'm looking forward to seeing that as as things um progress and time goes on but I think social media has helped with that where people have more access to people's personalities. So it helps them kind of get more recognition than just being like what you're doing on the floor. And um, what do you, what do you want to see for yourself? What is your dream that anything that you haven't done 
that you want to do in the future because you really have the whole world once we open it up again um, is going to be open to you to pick and choose what you want to do so is there anything that you've always wanted to do that you couldn't do that you're going to that you're going to say like this is the top of my bucket list I must do this you know, I think my answer to that would be it, it's more things that I want to do on a personal note. And I feel very grateful for all of the all the great opportunities I've gotten to do. And I have some other really exciting ones coming up that I'm so grateful for. But I'm really working on getting to know myself. If I took away the gymnast, just figuring out, like stripping it down and and who would I be? So that's what I'm excited to do is just uh, meeting new friends, connecting with new people, and just getting to know the real me. You know, I think um, sometimes it's hard to figure out like what you want or who you want to be. And it takes time to figure that out. Especially like you, people know you because you are a gymnast and you are an Olympian. And people know Perry because she is disabled and she's on a ventilator. And, you know, you have certain people look at you a certain way and it's very hard sometimes for you to see yourself outside of that and I think you know that's what you have to do you have to but it's also part of your history you can't take that away so it becomes part of you but it becomes a way to propel yourself to do something else that you want to do yeah my mom when I came forward about being a survivor my mom I almost like I was writing a book and I, I was really thinking about like going back and forth of not including it. And I just like, I, I knew, I knew I like, or I thought I wanted to come forward at some point, but I was just like really nervous. And I was just feeling, I think I was more afraid of just like the feeling, the shame, you know, and just feeling uncomfortable and just not really sure. And my mom said, you know, it's part of the fabric of your life. You know, it's like a chapter of your life and it's, it's making me into who I am. And so that's something that's kind of stuck with me. Right. I agree. You can't take it away. Everything that happens. I don't believe everything happens for a reason. I, I don't like it when people say that because I don't believe in that. I think things happen and then you re it's how you react to it that then creates which way you're going to go, which path you're going to go on, you know, and, and um, you know, you had something horrible happen to you, but you are turning it around for so many others by stepping up and, and doing what you want to do to make things better. So, um, you know, you could have gone totally the other way and not said anything and not done anything. And then there would be people who would still be hurt. And, you know, it, you, you reacted to it the way that you did and, and made it somehow so much better for everybody else. Thank you. Right. You took charge of yourself. And so I'm sure that must have been very gratifying, but it just shows that you really are so fierce in, in your life, which is amazing. I can't imagine you settling down into your old age of 27 and just <laughs> gardening at home and, and doing your little plants and playing with your puppy. And I do love that. It, that is fun. <laughs> A good balance. Right. Perry also um, is going to do amazing things and she's tough. Sometimes I wonder how I birthed such a, a tough kid because, mm -hmm. you know, but, you know, she, I made her and she made herself and who she is. And, and um, but she also has a very sweet side to her too. But I think, uh, you, you know, as women, you, there's no reason why we can't do both. Yeah. Absolutely. Sweet. Well, I, I really enjoyed our conversation and I'm super glad to be talking to you guys again. And I'm glad to be connected with you both. Obviously, this is not going to be just the, the only time that we chat. So you guys have been so sweet and just giving me so many amazing ideas. And I'm just so grateful to learn from both of you. And Perry, I think this hopefully goes without saying, but I I think you are so fierce and so amazing. And um, the way that you help other people is just, there's, there's no words. And I'm very, very inspired by that. And just so, I'm in awe of how much you look out for other people. It's amazing. You should be really proud of yourself.